Um, hi, Matt. Uh, really excited to be uh, talking to you today. Um, uh, my first question is in regards to short film She, which is on the Cinemagic Festival website right now. Um, I happened to watch it and I thought it was brilliant. Um, I love like the dynamic pace of it and it just happened really captivated from the get go. I'd really rec recommend anyone who hasn't seen it to go um, and watch it. I think it's today's like the last day you can watch it. Um, but my question for you is, uh, how did you first become inspired to write this story? Well, I became inspired because I got it wrong on the first short film that I wrote, Acid Burn. So that was like, I did that in 2009 and that was with uh, the model Agnes Dane, who then became an actress. And, and I did the, the classic pro, um, mistake of trying to fit a feature film into a short film. So it was so convoluted. It had really mad twists and turns and really you couldn't understand the narrative. So I, I was still working with Aggie at that, that moment and I just said, listen, I want to write something that's uh, pretty linear and much more simple than what we've done. And I wanted to write a short, short film. And I wrote She um, for her to do because we were sort of collaborating at that time. Um, but then it, you know, things happen. So it's been in the, in the, in the shelf, on the shelf for nine years. Really love like the, the snappy cuts and edits. Cause that's kind of like keeping the motion of the story. Was that something that you wrote into the script? Like those, um, those shots, like changing that, like dynamically and, and a really fast paced, or was that something that you worked on collaboratively? No, no, I, it, was, it was all in the script and it was about making, um, I saw she as a, as a poem really. I didn't, that's mm. how I approached it. So every stanza or every line I wanted to cut to a different location just because it is a very short short and you know within that five minutes I wanted to get as many locations as possible that didn't, that, that kind of did confuse the viewer so that you were going, what is happening? Where is she going? But gradually you get to understand that she is escaping from the city into the countryside and life gets more green and there she gets calmer and calmer the more that she arrives in mother nature. So no, the, the, all the cuts were pretty much there. It's like most of the things I write a pretty visual, there's not much room for sort of negotiation. Um, and then, you know, when you get someone like Abigail Laurie, because I, I was also watching Tin Star at the time. So Tin Star was out 2019, I think maybe the second season. And I was just watching her thinking she was great. And, uh, <laughs> and then I just thought she'd be great for she as well. And I managed to get the script to her agent and she said, yeah, let's do it. And so did you actually film that um, like at the, during lockdown? Was that like- No, so 2019 summer, we did it uh, August. So it was three days, only three days. And we got, I was gonna say 17 locations in, in three days between Manchester and the Lake District. So within that, we had to travel up. So when she's on the train, we're actually traveling up to Penrith to then get off and go and do the late district for two days. So, but when you have someone as brilliant as that and you know what you're doing and the, and the scenery just becomes more and more panoramic uh, mm -hmm. and the weather doesn't sheet it down as it were, then you've got a good chance of being able to pull it off. My next question is about um, how did you uh, know you wanted to become a writer and, or work in the film industry and how did you go about pursuing that? I didn't know I wanted to be a writer in the film industry at all. I, I was, I can honestly say I fluked it into the industry. I got a job as a, the first runner on Hollyoaks uh, back in 1994, but I was 24 at that time and I'd had a year unemployed, like just dossing, just doing nothing. And I, and it was only through contacts. And I think that's important to say is that personality and, and contacts should uh, should should help you through life. Some, you don't know what that person might open for you yeah. right down the line. Uh, I'm not saying I'm a fantastic personality, but that 
I must have done something right to get me in the door for an interview at Hollyoaks, which I, I, I turned up late for. Um, <laughs> and I'm slightly inebriated from the night before. Uh, but I managed just to black my way through. So it was only once I started working, I didn't even know what a shoot was or a, what end of a camera it was. I mean, I just got a job of basically making tea and stopping people from walking through and doing that, like sound turning and all that. Um, and then I started reading scripts. Now with Hollyoaks, you were reading three scripts a week. So that's another thing I would say is that you cannot expect to be a script writer if you don't read scripts. You, mm. you have to make it, even, even the ones you don't like in many ways are more important than the ones that you do like, because then you can see how not to do it. But, um, I was then in a position where I was reading, a fortunate position of reading some good scripts, some bad scripts, some very, very bad scripts, um, and, and sort of processing how to break them down to make them feasible for what my job was, which is to make the production happen. And uh, that was invaluable as far as guiding me. I still hadn't chosen to be a screenwriter at that point, but guiding me in a way that was kind of making me more um, aware and, and educating me in the screenwriting process uh, to a point where sort of five years after getting that runner's job, I decided to, to start inputting my own ideas into a spec script. And layout of a professional script is very important. People won't read your scripts unless they're professionally laid out. And I knew how to do that with movie magic and then onto final draft. What kind of attracts you to that kind of writing and um, telling those kind of stories? <laughs> well, the, people offer me money to do it. That's, that's, that kind of, <laughs> that's kind of the first thing, right? And uh, it just so happens that uh, those are the projects that have been made. Now I've written equally the same amount of scripts of fiction that just haven't been made and you know pains me to say it and I'm hoping by the end of my career that question might just be a little bit more oh you've got so many things coming in but I understand why people look at my CV and go oh right well he's the guy to go for dead northern rock stars um, but in general it's a case of producers and money people if they know the story within a book then it becomes a more viable economic outlay for them to do that. So if mm -hmm. you, so therefore films that um, have a real person, you're not trying to sell the story. Uh, so the risk is lower. So a first time writer or someone trying to get into the industry, it's not a bad idea to take someone's life or a life story that's out there in the public domain and take a spin on it because you have an angle then to then go to a producer who, who will then look at it and go, yeah, I know that story, I know that person. Therefore, the interest is peaked. So with me, it was just a case of, you know, I, I started off with control and then I decided just to keep going down that route because to get a body of work is very mm. important to be able to do what you want to do. Were there any like, writers and directors um when you were young that inspired you? Like what were your kind of favorite films? And well, you know? I mean, I was very much a soap kid. I really enjoyed the soaps. And I'm not, yeah. embarrassed, I'm not embarrassed to say that because they were just so easily accessible in them days. Uh, you know, when I was growing up sort of 80s and, and 90s and you know, just, just the constant storytelling. So, I mean, I was a massive Brookside fan. You won't remember Brookside or, or I'm not sure if you do, but Phil Redmond was the guy that created that, who also created Grange Hill. Uh, and Brookside was just like groundbreaking as far as uh, soap, soap storytelling was uh, concerned. But I still watch The Breakfast Club as well, about four times a year. I, I don't know if you know that about, I mean, that's a fantastic, I know, yeah. it's just brilliant. John Hughes. Yeah. And E.T., yeah, I still watch E.T., I still pick, I mean, you know, I like simple stories, but dressed up in sort of complicated clothes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think those are the best ways when you can just, you know, they, you talk about a log line, but I think it is really important to have a very succinct log line and know what you're talking about within that film, within that idea. 
because that one line means that you can really boil it down and then take it out there. Anything that's too big about an idea, it's going to be too big for the page as well. Have you um, felt like you've been getting a lot of work done or have you uh, found it very difficult with like making projects? I know your feature film got delayed, which is probably devastating. Oh, it, <laughs> it, was like, it was devastating to begin with. I thought, yeah. my, I thought it was all over. I thought, oh, I had three, I had three things go down. Uh, you know, and three, three projects that I've probably been working on for over, you know, five years, you know, and, and they were all filming at that time. One was the, the one that I was supposed to direct. The other one was a, an essay, a big budget SAS drama with, for Tom Hardy's company. Uh, and the third one was um, a BBC One marquee film. Uh, based, based on the heroin, you know, football abuse scandal that the documentary's just been out. So lots going on and lots of effort on my behalf and lots of writing because I put everything into it, probably too much. So when, it, then when they all went, I was like... But mm. then, you know, as a creative, as a writer, it's, it's what you do anyway. You sit in a room and you don't see anyone for ages. So it's, yeah. it's, like, it's like I started thinking, well, come on, you know, you've got a clean slate here. No one's expecting anything of you. Uh, what do you want to do? So I then went in and I managed to do two television pitches. Uh, one, hey. um, yeah, one, some big ones as well. So one, but what, but I boiled it down to what did I want to see? And I wanted to see a musical set in Ibiza. Yeah. <laughs> And they... Oh, that's really exciting. <laughs> I love musicals. All yeah, the a La La Land in Ibiza. So I yeah. wanted to do that with all the old classic house tracks and tunes and everything. So I've written that yeah. pitch, which Netflix is with Netflix right now, you know, fingers crossed. Um, and then I wrote a big boxing drama, which is uh, a passion of mine, but not based on the sort of rocky angle, but based on the promoters that surround the ring. So more like the snakes. So the lions are in the ring and the snakes surround it. So it has <laughs> legs. It's sort of like um, succession, but in boxing. And, you know, it, I had time to write really detailed outlines, which are not easy if you're writing other things, because exactly. you, you, your mind can get so overstimulated that, you know, outlines are sometimes take second place to scripts. So, you know, it was a really good, it was a really interesting time. And now coming out of lockdown, I'm glad I got those two projects out there. Is it a writer's dream, like having like all this free time? <laughs> it you is know? in many ways. I saw, yeah. you know, I, I really think on one side, yeah, it's horrible and, you know, life shut down, mm -hmm. but that the, the, the total clearing of the decks and the fact there's nothing on the calendar that stops you from thinking about what you want to create is a blessing, exactly. is a blessing that, I don't want it forever, don't get me, don't get me wrong. Yeah, but, oh, but exactly, I know you feel. <laughs> I'm ready to come out of it, but it, but it took me, it wasn't until July I started thinking about that musical, so it took me March, like three months really to get my head around sort of creating something from the first lockdown. That means you probably have been interested in writing when you were like younger. Was there like ever like a piece of writing that you'd written when you were younger that um, you remember being really proud of? And what was it about? Like, um... there was a, the first one was about when I was about eight and I came third in a creative writing contest at uh, Salford Schools it was at that time. And I remember, I remember I really, being proud because we had to go to like the town hall <laughs> or something. Oh, cool. And I still remember what the story was about. It was like um, some magpies kidnap a scarecrow uh, and they become, really, they become really good friends. So it was like, oh no, it, yeah, it was, it was, maybe I should do a short on that, an animated short. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I, yeah, so the, I was always good at, that's what I wanted to do at school. I wasn't really good at anything else. Creative writing was like something that absorbed me. And I think, you know, I still get that buzz today of being in the zone where you kind of forget who you are and it all pours out into these, you know, 
disparate, separate voices that somehow you're creating in your mind. I mean, it's a form of madness as well. And, you know, it's definitely, <laughs> yeah. it's definitely not sane, but that losing yourself in a story, especially when it's working the story within your mind, I think it's such a nice feeling. Um, and probably one of the reasons why people still write and create and keep doing it, even when they get a load of crap thrown at them afterwards, it's, it's probably something in that buzz of, uh, of getting, into, getting into your own mind. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta put it out there to actually receive criticism and then, but also receive great reviews as well. Totally, what... totally. I mean, you've got it. And I, I think you become, especially in the early days, it's, that's more, that's, that's a lot harder than doing it when you're you know, a grizzled old pro like me, because, <laughs> because you, it, it, it's so, it can really hurt your feelings. And, you, and also you can really question yourself to the point where am I going down the right road in life? You know, it becomes almost ex existential when people criticize your art. Uh, yeah. So, and there's no other way around it. There's no other way around it. You've got to put it out there and you've either you've got to take the rough with the smooth. And, um, you know, if it is good, then hopefully people recognize that. But there's a lot of people as well that don't read things properly. And I, and I know that, I don't understand why non-writers sometimes have the, um, not the goal, but why did they rule the roost over writers? Why? How can they know what's good when they're not writers themselves, you know? And another quick question I have is, um, I watched an interview you did about film stars don't die in Liverpool, and you mentioned how some of the characters were inspired by your own family members. Was that just because of like the, the home dynamic setting of that film, or is that something that you pull on in your writing regularly? I, yeah, I mean, I think anything that's sort of loosely contemporary in the Northwest, then I can kind <laughs> of, and, and, and more so like middle to lower working class, I can kind of transpose my family and people that I know onto those characters. But I would say in all characters, essentially they come from within the writer. I, yeah. I don't think it's possible to actually just... Uh, mirror someone you know onto a different character because the words come from within you. So, yeah. you know, every character I think is, uh, of course, is, um, uh, is, is kind of based on your previous experiences in life. So that's why everything comes into play. And I think there's a, there's a whole subconscious uh, angle to this that is really hard to uh, explain but it's it's about life and and you know I, I, all I can say is try and experience try and experience as much as you can you know good good and bad in a way and I don't mean I don't mean go off and do anything stupid but you know all, all those experiences somehow will culminate into uh, into your writing um, yeah. but it's very hard to pinpoint so like, do you prefer like just sitting down at a computer? Do you have like a specific, specific time of the day that you work at or do you have a routine or just write whenever? Well, first of all, I think the computer is a scary place and, I, and I, I like to not sit down at the computer until I know I can get the scene out. So uh -huh. Most of my work before I sit down there is done on really extensive outlines. Um, I probably show, but it's like I really nail it down, and I use cards, and I use uh, you know I use boards and images, and I pin them up all over my walls, and I and I really get to a point where the outline of maybe ten pages is agreed by me and the producer, and then. Mm -hmm. It's a case of, okay, that works. You've got someone else saying that outline works. That's when I finally sit down and start typing away. And normally the typing comes after I've written a scene longhand. So because I think there's such pressure of typing words into a computer, into a hard drive, into whatever, the 
fluidity, the, the, the space that you have of just writing longhand and crossing things out and sort of from brain to hand just feels much more, uh, it feels like I have this less danger within it. And so therefore I, I scribble out and I, then I get to a point where, right, I've got the basis of input in that into the screen where I'm not feel like I'm flailing. So I've got the point of the scene across. And I find that that works very well for me. So A4 pads, then just, and then I, if try it, I just feel that the pressure's off. And when you're actually inputting it, it's a, it's a much more of a, of a, of a further process in writing rather than going straight in and going, Oh no, delete, delete, no, I spelled wrong, blah, blah, you know, all that just isn't there. You, you, you kind of negate that by, by writing the scene longhand. No, that's a re really good uh, advice. Like, you know, having your, or just insight into your way you work, like having a routine and figuring out when you're most, you, you are your most creative. Um, that's really cool to hear. Uh, it's, it's energy though, Shot. I think that it's very important for writers to have energy. And I think sometimes you, you feel guilty when you, when you're not writing or you're not doing any work, but if you're tired, your ideas will be tired and your writing will be tired. So it's very yeah. important for you to put yourself in a position where the flow is at its, you know, its strongest. And, you know, I, it, it has its downfalls. I mean, you know, cause you can't really go out or you can't really have a massive drink cause you can't write and have go over. So you pretty much permitted in to that process but I feel that if you really want that script out if you really want to see it because so many people can start a script and not a lot of people can end them then you mm -hmm. really have to be in that regimented process where you know what your most strongest creative energy time is and for me that's nine till nine till twelve. Did you find there was any differences coming from tv writing and working to on working on big feature films and working, uh, writing them? Like, or was, or did you find they're very similar? Or what was your take on that? Yeah, I think no one, if I could go back, I'd, I'd educate myself about, you know, writing and structure. I mean, I read scripts, so I educated myself in that aspect, but I'm, I didn't go to college or no one really taught me anything to do with writing. It was all self-taught. So I wish I'd yeah. go back and, self-teach if that's the present sense of me going back but i wish i'd self-taught myself more about structure and narrative i wish i because yeah. i think you can teach that i think it's very difficult to teach writing good writing and um ideas and sparks i mean that's within you and that's that's something that i think is uh, as an x factor but you definitely can teach structure and i didn't do that i just thought writing a film was basically just longer than writing TV <laughs> and, and uh, just writing more words and really simplified the whole process. And I probably could have saved myself a lot of time and heartache if I just read a few of the books. I mean, there's some really good ones out now. I mean, I'm sure you know about Save the Cat. Yeah. Save the Cat. Those books are really good, I think. I mean, as far as just getting you in there. And... Doing, do you feel like doing a feature film is maybe more freeing as a writer? Because you have like less of those structures of those narratives um, than like working on a, a feature film. Or do you like working with that structure now that you've gotten, like, gotten used to it? Um, or like I, I, I mean, I like it now because I know that it works. So, yeah. so that sort of stream of consciousness days where I thought, oh, that, they're cool, they're gone. Because, uh, I, 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 but saying that though, she was a bit like a stream of consciousness because I didn't feel any pressure to actually, you know, write that. And that was me sat down and just, and just went for it really. There was, there was no cuts in it to begin with. It was just a speech. And then, yeah. I, then I overlaid the locations. But I, that was a lot to do with what was available. So it was how you you know, you, you facilitate the shooting side of it. But originally she was just a big lump of words. Uh, so maybe I'm contradicting myself. I really, really enjoyed doing that. Uh, but in general, no, if you, 
you've got to, if you're on a feature for sure you've got to know where you're going because you can be like five weeks into that writing process and you just you can't even remember what you've written on the first day you have no idea mm -hmm. uh you know and if you don't have some structural process or have that in place or to the side of your computer on the wall then you can find yourself just getting totally lost and that's the most dispiriting thing which a lot of screenwriters end up doing is like a third of the way through the writing process they forget what they're writing about and they find it very very, very difficult to write the most important bit which is the end i would like to the contrast between knowing when you're having structure and making sure that you've got that so you don't feel dispirited and not know where you're going yeah but it's interesting and she though how it started out as stream of consciousness and then you structured it as you went along to work on the script yeah i mean it was a stream of consciousness but within the parameters of i knew that she'd start i mean originally she was starting in a bedroom and it was after a night out and we know she's not had any sleep to her ending, in, ending up on a mountain. And I knew that, that that's the beginning and the end. So I had the, I had the end, I had the back, mm -hmm. but everything else was just like, how do I get there was just, uh, okay, let's sit down. And I, and I wrote it longhand again first before I actually sort of inputted it into any kind of script format. But my last question is, I think you mentioned it earlier, but uh, about having a passion project. So do you have any scripts and drawers? You say you do. Uh, but anything you're really itching to get made or um, something in the works right now? Yeah, well, it, it's, it's the Sean Ryder project, which yeah. um, is twist, it's called Twisting My Melon, and, uh, which is a Steve McQueen saying. I don't know if you know that. Steve, Steve McQueen was in a, the, the film star, was in a documentary, and some director was asking Steve, uh, no, he was asking the director, like, what the hell are you doing? And the director comes out with some bullshit answer. And, Steve McQueen says, you're twisting my melon, man. So it's like you're twisting my brain. Um, and that's kind of a really apt thing for Sean. But I bought the rights to his biography uh, six years ago because he was, uh, he was a big figure in my youth. Um, and I thought that if someone offered me to, someone offered to do the film and they had the rights and I said, no, I'm not doing it. Uh, and then I realized, that if they did it and I didn't get on board it would be really really bad so yeah. <laughs> anyway these people turned out to be charlatans which is quite often in the film business as well they had no money and that and the, the rights came up so I decided to go and purchase the rights which aren't cheap and and the whole thing was for me to get from this from script to screen so I was going to direct this as my first feature so um, I've spent quite a lot of time finessing the script. It's been through some mad times, like finances pulling out, COVID, uh, actors going missing. Um, but now it feels like it's just coming back. My question is, have you ever gotten halfway through a script and then suddenly, like, no other ideas have come to mind? And if so, how would you go about getting new ideas to come again? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a tough one. First of all, yeah, I think every writer goes through that. I think the, the big question I would have for that writer, I'm not saying it's you, is do you know your end well enough? Because if you do, then you should be able to fashion uh, some kind of through narrative that gets you to that end. If the end isn't working, or if you don't have an end, then you might be in trouble. Um, so I think that question's answer all lies in what is your end of the, of the, of the script and whether it works within the first half of what you've already written. How important is it from a writer's point of view to sort of align yourself with somebody to, to get your work sort of forward and, and out there? It, it, it depends at what level those people are. I mean, if, they're, if yeah. they're further along in the industry than you, then yes, that's a, that's a really good idea. But if they're the same or even below, you've got to ask yourself, are they going to help you get your work out there or 
are they not? And sometimes it's a hard question to, to answer. But I think in, in general, I would go for, if you're a writer, it's all about your writing and your ideas. And it's how you present those ideas. They're not particularly looking, especially if it's a television idea, even if it's a film idea, I, th I still think they're looking at how you present that. So you probably need in today's world, uh, you need a two page pitch at least, or a three page to boil it down. And they're not easy to do with some kind of maybe first five to 10 pages, I think to show, especially as a, as a new writer that, that you can lay out properly and open a film which let, let's face it, it's the most fun part of it is to open it. But if you can't open it, then you know, what's the point? So I would go with those two samples and you could go further and make it really pictorial. I know that the industry's going down the route of digital pictures. I know that I've just done one of them, but they cost a lot of money. But the more, the more images involved and the more snappier it is and the more of a selling document you can put together, I think also helps because people are generally lazy. Yeah. So if you can just grab them in and then back it up with your, your, your two pager and then they'll probably get to your, your sample 10 pages of scripts, then make that as professional as possible and then try and get it into producers, professional producers hands. Um, that's how I'd look at it or into the writer's room or into places which, you know, have the uh, ability to, to distribute work or bring you on. Is it something, you know, that you would sort of promote in terms of getting other people, whether it be people in the industry or friends or people a little bit further on in the industry to, to read ideas and to read work? Like how beneficial is that? Um, or is it better just sort of, especially with the friends and family sort of thing, is it better not to share your work with somebody like, you know, as close as friends and family? I think if there's anyone that you've got that is making a living out of this industry, you yeah. give it to them and you try and get a point of view, you try and get a, a comment or a, or a, you know, a, a yeah, and getting people to read things is the hardest thing. So I wouldn't hold back um, on, on that. I think, you know, some people are scared of their ideas being stolen, but I'm not sure about that. Um, hmm. But generally, I, I would say the more feedback you get and you would then be able to look at the median of what the comment is. Right, and you might get extremes, but then you just look and you get an idea of what the criticism may be or what's great about it and what's, and what's, what's wrong about it. I mean, the, the, the gold, sort of the, the, the gold at the end of the rainbow is to find someone who can just do that every time and it's a one-stop shop. But um, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure about the writer's room. I've been in there a couple of times to do talks and... Um, I think if you can get in on those, on those places, I, I, they look great on your CV. But uh, writing spec scripts for programs, I think, is underrated a little bit. So Death in Paradise, I don't know, these places that come out, EastEnders, just, just writing something that, that everyone's always on the look for new young writers. It's just the hardest bit, but like with any other subscriber, industry is getting your work into someone's hand and getting your best work into that person's hand because you only have one shot as well they're not going to go to you okay what else have you got if that first script is really awful to read but on a positive note they might go well <laughs> oh, please, there's three million quid per episode go and give me 10 you know they could do that as well so i just want to thank you for for your time and charlotte for all of those brilliant questions which were very um, insightful and, and thought-provoking as well. And I know 
um, the young filmmakers here can apply that knowledge to their own projects and um, ideas that are that are being developed in the here and now, but also you know in in the future. Um, so on behalf of everybody, thank you so much, Matt. And um, who knows, it would be be great to get you over to Belfast. Um, when things change with sort of uh, the relaxing of restrictions and in, in months to come um, and you've just been very generous with your time. So thank you. Um, thank you all very much. Thank you. Listen, look, everyone just stay creative. I mean, I know it's hard sometimes to actually, you know, put that into practice, but I think that's so important. Don't let yourself go rusty. Uh, Keep going, keep writing, whatever it is, if it's a poem or just something that just, you know, keeps those creative juices flowing. It might not be the masterpiece that you want it to be, but I think it all helps to, to, uh, to head on, on that journey, which hopefully ends up with you getting a job doing something that you love. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.